listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Hello, everyone. Thank you for letting me be part of your day. My name is Jerry Mitchell, your host for Give God 90. Um, Myra's not actually in her supervisor's chair, but she is nearby. <laughs> Hi, everyone. She uh, had shoulder surgery Tuesday morning, so she is attempting to recover from that. And it's uh, kind of interesting this time. She's uh, doing well. I think she seems to be doing well, although I'm the bad one to ask. I'm a terrible caregiver. (laughs) Uh, She is close enough to make sure that I kind of stay on track, but I am on the side that she can't reach out and tap me if need be. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. She, she uh, had surgery Tuesday morning and, is doing well, well enough. She hasn't been taking her really high octane pain meds, so that's a good thing. Uh, prayers are appreciated. You know, the healing part we know that the Almighty's got taken care of. But if you really feel the urge to pray for her, um, pray for her because I'm the one that's taking care of her at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she yeah, she needs relief from that. Okay, <laughs> um, we if you're new here, make sure you check out the website givegodnani.com. There's lots of good stuff there to take care of. We appreciate uh, your comments. If you want to comment uh, in the chat room through Spreaker, that's fine. There's other ways to get up with us on various social media as well. Uh, there's all kinds of things there. If you uh, hit those notification buttons, you know, that works in the algorithms to bring us up. Uh, the other thing is if you like what you hear and you think other people need to hear it, don't be afraid to share. You're more than welcome to share this out there uh, because if you are blessed by it, chances are your family and friends will be and your enemies need to be as well. And so uh, to be, to begin tonight... I want to say something about a statement that I made. um, And a couple of people have questioned it. And I said that I have never heard from a victim of abortion. Now, some people have pointed out that there are people out there who have survived abortion attempts for various reasons, and they're absolutely correct. They have. Uh, One is Pastor Marvin Hightower, and he tells how he survived two abortion attempts. That's right. Uh, His mother went twice to the same doctor, went through the procedure, and yet here he is years later, now a pastor. Uh, Another is a young lady, uh, Melissa Oden. Uh, She survived an abortion. They actually know that uh, she was one of uh, twins. I almost said one of two twins, and that is technically incorrect. You can't have two twins. You can't be one of two twins because that would make it quadruplets, right? Anyway, um, she uh, and many, many others out there offer their stories about this. One thing that every one of them that I have listened to has in common is none of them have any animosity at all towards their, well, what I will call conception mother okay Uh, most who have met their conception mother actually offer forgiveness and understanding some even uh, have friendships or some type of relationship Uh, they have some have gotten close Uh, the thing is i don't consider these people to be victims at all these people are survivors that's that's the word uh, and, and not only have they survived 
but most have actually been able to thrive and live a very, very good life, a life um, that the victims of abortion never had a chance to have. And that brings me to something that has become a pet peeve of mine, and that is using words improperly. You know, words used to mean things. Um, now, confusing the words victim and survivor may not seem to be the world's most worst offense, right? After all, if someone... Well, let me use this analogy. If somebody is involved in an automobile accident, which is no fault of their own, uh, we could maybe consider them victims if they're injured, right? <clears throat> if they uh, suffer some form of physical harm. Think about this. If someone survives an attempted murder and they've never done anything to offend the person who's trying to kill them, they come out completely unharmed. Are they a victim or are they a survivor? In English, the saying has become they, these people were victims of a crime, and that, that may be true to some extent, but the reality is they survived a very heinous act. Do they deserve some type of compensation? Maybe. You know, they just certainly deserve justice. But do they deserve to carry around a grudge for the rest of their life? No one should need to carry a burden like that. You know, does it take time to get to a place where they no longer uh, feel emotionally attached to being a victim? You know, absolutely primarily because of the way society presents the problem today. <clears throat> There's some really, really, really interesting uh, old videos out there that are available in various places. And one I, I particularly really like to watch. Uh, it has a couple of old Civil War veterans uh, from either side of the U.S. Civil War uh, who up until 1865, you know, these guys were trying to kill each other. But in the early 20th, 20th century, in the early, I can't talk tonight, in the early 20th century, they had put all that aggression and anger aside, and they were able to actually build friendships. We seem to have become a worldly culture that, that loves to hate that that sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? Hmm. We love to hate. And part of that hatred towards other people, just a part of that hatred towards other people, will slowly allow unholy spirits to overtake the way we should be living. It does quite literally, affect us from the inside out. You know, Jonah didn't like the people of Nineveh very much. He chose, you know, he says, I'm, I'm going to go the other way, I'm going to turn my head, and I'm going to let the Creator destroy these people. When he had heard that it was the Creator himself that asked Jonah to go and proclaim his word to them. Now, I will confess, I'm a lot like Jonah. Okay, that's my confession. And I think many of us probably have a little bit of Jonah in them from time to time. You know, currently we live in a resort. There's a lot of traffic in the summertime. The other day I was coming home. I uh, actually had gone out to get my a couple of things. And I was sitting in traffic a lot of traffic. And I was thinking how stupid some people are. And I was and I realized, you know, I'm out there in this too, right? I'm just as bad. Uh, I said this little short conversation with the Almighty as I sat there in this long line of traffic. I don't know why you allow some people to act the way they do. But maybe if you were able to show them how foolish they act, it might help, at least some of them. I say all that to emphasize nobody needs to carry around a burden 
or a grudge because it serves no purpose. And that is exactly what the survivors of, the, of abortion are saying. They've been given a chance at life. They don't want to waste it. And that brings up an interesting question in my mind anyway. What is life? Well, in today's English, it has very little meaning to some people. Because some people choose to murder the innocent, probably because they have no hope. They've never been shown the equal love from others. Now, they, ha- they may have felt cared for, but they've never experienced a kind of love that can only come from the Creator. Because the word of life has lost its proper definition. See, words used to mean things. In Genesis 32.30, we read, Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. His life was preserved. It took Jacob seeing his creator up close and personal to remind him His life is eternal. See, life doesn't begin at conception. Now, there's a lot of pro-choice people out there who just took a deep breath and, and spit out their coffee or something, depending on when you're listening to this. But life doesn't begin at conception. Our earthly experience and existence begins at conception. But all of mankind is somehow forgotten a simple concept. We are eternal. Life on earth begins at conception. Life itself, who we are, is eternal. Life doesn't revolve around this short time we spend on earth. Now, our lives should revolve around the Creator's ideas for what he wants us to do, right? You see, when we change the definitions, we can make words mean whatever we want them to. I like to use the English word cool as an example. It used to mean chilly to the touch or a slightly cold sensation, but today it's used to mean many, many different things. And I I can't speak about this subject without bringing up gender. Because gender is a grammatical term. Has absolutely nothing to do with biology. Until the English language evolved a few years ago. Uh, And now, for some reason, we consider gender biological because it's more acceptable it's a more acceptable term a more acceptable word than sex for some people now this actually happened shortly after sex became a verb now, recently i'm going to step on some toes here recently during her testimony in the senate confirmation hearing uh Katenji brown jackson who was just uh uh sworn in to the United States Supreme Court, she was giving her testimony in Congress, and someone asked her, (laughs) what is a woman? Well, her answer, wait a minute, more precisely, her non-answer or her refusal to answer is kind of classic. She said, I'm not a biologist. Now, if someone is supposed to be intelligent enough to be a Supreme Court justice, and they cannot define the word woman. How is she supposed to define any word in the Constitution? If she can't define a simple word, how is she then qualified to sit on the Supreme Court? Something to think about. Doesn't just happen in the United States either. This happens every democracy or every republic around the world. 
And then she brought biology into a place that has all but rejected any biological standards at all. That was kind of surprising. You know, I, I really don't know how any person who doesn't speak English can learn the English language today because it's changing so quickly. <laughs> Myra and I were watching the news show earlier today, and somebody used the term pansexual. Myra asked what it meant because you know the context of the way she used the word um, just wasn't correct. And I, I will confess this too today. The only thing I could say was, I, I'm not sure what it means anymore. I, I don't know. Well, I know what it used to mean, but after hearing the interview, I, I'm not really sure what it's supposed to mean. I'm not even sure that the, the person who spoke the word knows what it means. You know, when the Creator confused the, the language on the plains of Shinar, it did more than cause the breakdown of communication between people. It literally causes the separation between people. And that separation continues today, and it's growing even more broadly today. And sadly, many, many believers have fallen into this trap of confused language. The Spirit Demon and devils are three distinctly different things. But believers, just like almost everyone else in the world, uses those three words interchangeably in today's cultures. They're three different things, completely different things, but we use them interchangeably. They have lost their definitions words used to mean things. Salvation today seems to have the definition of a passport to heaven. But originally, salvation is more of a rescue or an escape from evil. In uh, Psalm 118.15, that should be 119.15, David writes that the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. Did you catch that salvation is in the tabernacles, plural? It can be in more than one place. But the tabernacles of who? You see, the righteous... The righteous rescue is supposed to be among the believers. Is that true today? In Jonah 2.9, we read, I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. He's promising to pay exactly what he has said he would do. And then he says, salvation is of Jehovah. When we treat salvation like it's a passport to heaven, complete with a stamped visa, we diminish the definition of the word. We twist Scripture. And that is among believers. <clears throat> well, is it okay to use slang? In a language, it's cool. Did you see what I did there? There's a, a person on a local t television station uh, who, at the end of her little blurb about doing the weather, uses a Spanish phrase I wasn't familiar with. And I asked uh, a couple of people that I, I know speak Spanish fluently what it meant. And they just kind of looked at me like, what are you talking about? That that's that's not something we say. That's not in our you you can't put those two words together. But this young lady on television does it all the time. So it's not just the English language that, that this is exposed to. 
the evolution of language happens in every spoken language today. So, is it okay to use slang? It's cool. Do you know what a woman is? Pansexual. Do you know what gender you are? Or my favorite one. What's your preferred pronoun? <laughs> you know, I, I jokingly say that my preferred pronoun is Supreme Emperor of the Universe. I had a friend tell me the other day, I can't use that. It's not a pronoun. Well, since we're changing the definition of words, why can't it be a pronoun? Obviously, we've reached a point in history where I can define pronoun to be whatever I say it is, and you have to agree with me. After all, there's no more grammar police. Maybe we've reached a different place in history, though. You know, in Isaiah, we read, Woe to them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Have we finally gotten to this place in Isaiah chapter 5? But nobody's listening to the warning? Woe to them. Well, here we have another issue. Uh, it might not be woe, but it sounds good. The, the Hebrew word can be defined a couple of different ways. Ah, as in slightly surprised. Alas. Or even ha ha ha. You see, our creator laughs at the people who change the definition of words because he gave us those definitions, just like he named the stars. You don't think he named the stars? Psalm 147.4. Uh, he determines the number of the stars, and he calls each of them by name. Isaiah 40.26, lift up your eyes on high. Who created all these? He leads forth the starry host by number. He calls each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. The Creator also gave us language. He would later confuse that language to suit his purpose. But here's something else to think about in Isaiah sixty five, seventeen. Behold I create new new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Is it possible that Isaiah's prophetic words are playing out right in front of us? Is the Creator preparing his most, most faithful believers to learn his perfect language, one that will never be corrupted? Maybe a warning from David needs to be remembered. In Psalm 119, 155, salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not his instruction. Evolution. Even the evolution of language is a trap for the weak-minded and the faint at heart. These are the people who have no hope. They have no trust in our Creator. On the new earth, words will mean things once again. We will speak the same language, and each of us will define those words exactly the same. There will be nothing that we cannot accomplish because this time everyone will be united in our desire to please our Creator. Each of us will use the skills that we have, that, we, that He has given to us, to benefit the others around us. Now, I know I've, I've poked a lot of fun at, at this confusing language thing, but that's cool. I've been doing it for a long time. When this whole politically correct thing came out and nobody wanted to be called a janitor or anybody because it sounded demeaning, let's face it if, it, if an environmental engineer pushes the same broom for the same pay, why shouldn't we describe the job properly? Now, is that job any more or less important because of what we call it? Well, no. But it is something that absolutely needs to be done. 
you know, scrubbing toilets will definitely keep you humble. I know. I do it here at ho- at home. And I have done it when I managed one of the, or I, I did it when I managed one of the offices that I used to work at and for a very short time. You see, no job is beneath anyone. You know, we spoke with a, a fellow who drove a trash truck a few years ago. He was in a store purchasing some cards for his customers on his route. And I thought that was one of the greatest displays of appreciation I could think of. Someone who most people in the United States would consider to have a very lowly job was actually able to show compassion and care for the people he'd come to know as his customers. He knew how to treat everyone equally. He understood something that as simple as a card had the ability to make people happy. Now, did the words on the card mean the same thing to the customers as it did to him? I I don't know. But I do know that his actions spoke volumes. If our language is evolving, could our actions evolve to match those words as well? Hmm. It sure seems like it for those who want to call evil good and good evil. Because that's exactly the way they're acting. Probably because that way, they get to feel like they are God. They're in control of something. And that's what the whole changing definitions is about anyway. Someone wants to believe that they have the power and the authority to change something that our Creator has already established. They want to be so rebellious as to change the definitions of the language that He gave to us. I'm not talking about you know Hebrew or English or Spanish or Portuguese. I'm talking about the way we communicate. Because it What I'm talking about crosses every language barrier there is, except one. And that is the language that he speaks to us with. Because when he speaks, he knows exactly the words to use. Those words can bring us comfort. Those words can bring us correction and direction. Those words can bring us love, but primarily... His words bring us life. This is usually where I ask Meyer if she has anything to add, but <laughs> um, I don't think she's in the uh, mood to answer. So, until Monday, yeah, today's Thursday, until Monday, we wish you many, many blessings, everyone.